good morning and welcome to One Tourism World, a conversion point and the global hub for pioneers, entrepreneurs, and visionaries from the global tourism and hospitality sectors. We bring to you an exciting platform featuring distinguished leaders ready to share their groundbreaking ideas on cutting edge topics that are revolutionizing the industry. Our experts come from a diverse uh, set of fields, including luxury hospitality, eco-tourism, eco digital transformation, and more, and are, are set to unravel the latest industry developments. One Tourism World is a vibrant community here on the One Business World platform that encourages collaboration and open dialogue to catalyze positive change within the tourism and hospitality sectors. Join us now in this discovery of journey, innovation, and growth. Let's shape the future of the industry together here at One Tourism World. So this morning, we're, we are joined here by uh, Bertrand Pettit. He is joining us today from Monaco, as well as our, our guest, uh, uh, Bruce Nirenberg, also joining us from Orlando, Florida. Good morning, gentlemen. Actually, good afternoon to you, Bertrand, because you're here. Good afternoon. Good morning, guys. Let me uh, let me welcome you both. And Bertrand, why don't you uh, why don't you take take the lead here? Yes, of course. Well, thank you very much, Glenn. And uh, today, today we're very very humbled, or I'm very humbled, to welcome someone who honestly doesn't really need much presentation in the cruise industry. Uh, Bruce Nirenberg uh, is our is our guest tonight. And Bruce, in my opinion, is, is one of the great entrepreneurs in our industry. Bruce has been at the origin of several cruise lines. He has been he heading several cruise ventures. And also some of the cruise uh, projects or cruise activities in the sense that we take for granted today, well, Bruce just happened to be at the origin of many, many of those. So uh, it also... The reason why we wanted Bruce in our One Tourism World uh, webinar is because the One Tourism World is very centered around entrepreneurs, creating ideas, fostering ideas. And as such, I couldn't find a better candidate for this webinar than Bruce, who again has uh, spearheaded so many, so many projects. And today, actually, Bruce will tell us about what may happen in the near future in the cruise industry. And it's fascinating to hear from such a leader some of the, well, possible projects that may that may develop in the near future in the cruise industry. So, Bruce, thank you very much for being our guest today in this One Tourism World. And the floor is yours. If you want to introduce yourself in a few words, say a few things about your incredible career in the cruise industry. Well, good morning and afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here. This is one of my favorite things to do is to talk about my industry that's been so good to me and my family. So anytime I can encourage people to contribute and participate and watch it grow, I feel like that's the best thing I can return to the industry and the people that are part of it. Uh, what I'm going to do is instead of just read off a, a background of what I've been doing for the last 50 years in the cruise business, uh, I decided to weave that in with some of the things that I found to be the most important things that I was involved in. What did I learn? Quite often you learn some very valuable things from some of your mistakes as well as your successes. So those are the kind of things that if I can impart to people who might be interested in growing their career paths and cruising or to travel industry, I can be a help there. But if I go back to the beginning, I was a young man. I went to the University of Miami in, in Coral Gables, Florida. I had a great experience there and raised all kinds of hell while I was a young man. It was a great place to go to school. And uh, while there, I also got a part-time job in my last year at, uh, at the U uh, as an airport ticket agent for an airline that doesn't exist any longer. But then it was the second largest in the world, Eastern Airlines. It was a great experience. This is pre-digital age. Uh, you had to learn how to write tickets. Every airline ticket that people bought was written out manually. They didn't even have print ticket printers yet. So reservations were manual. The whole thing was uh, like from the dark ages. Airplanes, a big airplane had 150 seats on it. So it was a great place to learn. And what it did, it made you learn everything that you had to do. You didn't, it wasn't handed to you on a silver platter. I learned so much that I didn't realize I had learned until later on when I used many of these things in, the, in my career path later on. Most important thing I learned was that you could take the chairman of the board of a major company. When they walk into an airport, they're a three-year-old. People are, they have a dynamic tension when they travel, especially with their families, on vacations, arrangements, making sure everything works. They're already wound up by the time they get to the airport. But back then, 
it was even worse because people weren't as experienced at it. So, but it was it was a great place to learn. It was before deregulation, so all the airlines charged the same fares. I learned what service meant because the only way you would take one airline versus another was the service on board. It's the opposite of today. Price was not an issue. Everybody had the same fares. We used to serve steak and lobster to passengers and coach on the flights back then. I'm not, and I'm not kidding. It was a, a service called something else. And we actually took their orders. When you walked up to the gate to get on the plane, you were asked, would you like steak or lobster on your flight to New York, sir? I mean, think about that today. You're lucky if you get a roasted peanut versus a steak or a lobster. So that was how I grew up. And that's where I learned what it meant to, to make people happy and how when, when you had to really compete on service. So I took that experience. I worked at the airport for about four years, got, uh, got a job as a sales rep for, with the same airline. Uh, and the only reason I got the job, because the airlines were very uh, uh, seniority oriented as they promoted, I was still a young guy. And uh, they had an opening in a place called Milwaukee, Wisconsin, it was at one station airport that you had two slots at the ticket counter and you had two flights a day, one to Atlanta and one to Miami. And we were the smallest airline in the, in the airport. So there really wasn't much activity. Nobody else wanted to go there. So I got the job. I was very lucky. It was the best thing that ever happened to me because being a very small station, you had to learn once again, how everything worked, how the airplanes were, were handled, how the passengers were handled. Great experience. And while I was there, I realized that I wasn't going to get famous because of my two flights a day. If I wanted to get ahead, I had to figure out something else to do. So it forced me to be th uh, thinking about what to do. And I found out that the Midwest of the United States was a big charter market. I, I was in Milwaukee, right near Chicago. People went to Vegas a lot back then. They would charter a, a plane in their organization and go on gambling junkets. And the big airline was United. So people would call and get a quote. But I, it took me five days to get an answer from the my, Miami office as far as a fare. I found out that, I, I, why why was it taking so long? And I got called the guy down there and he said, well, it's because you're just a small station and we have to take care of Chicago and New York and Philadelphia before we get to you. So I said, how hard is it to calculate a, a cost of a charter? He showed me how to do it. Within 24 hours, I was on the phone to my clients, turning around quotes to them and, and within a 24 hour period that used to take five days. I was now doing the business faster than my competitors at United. And all of a sudden charter business started to come into our station. So we sold more charters than we did tickets on our own flights. And what happened is it, it, it got a lot of notoriety at the company. And I was in my first year on the job at a small station, the salesman of the year at the whole airline, because it was innovative. It was creative. I tried to find a way to turn something into something that could be meaningful to the company. People like that kind of stuff. I learned a very valuable lesson. Don't let your restrictive environment ever stop you from trying new things. That was a very important part of my life. So after a year and a half, I got promoted to the regional staff in Chicago. And there, once again, I, I learned that it, the, the crew things of life, the, uh, the oil crisis hit in the Mideast, the cartels were created, and the airlines went into a tailspin. So they told me, I said, well, we're going to have to lay some people off. But worst case, you'll be at the baggage claim area at the airport. So don't worry about it. And I said, well, that's interesting. So I, I had a step back and I realized that the world was not always your friend, no matter what you accomplished, and especially as a young person. A good friend of mine who I worked with at Eastern, he was in staff in, in Miami, uh, a fellow named Dave Christopher, who's no longer with us, but was a real sweet man. And he was offered a job with an, a cruise line. And uh, it was in Chicago. He was in Miami and he turned it down because his family didn't want to move to Chicago. He gave them my name. They contacted me and they interviewed me for the job. And it was the regional director for Norwegian Caribbean Lines, which became Norwegian Cruise Lines later on. And uh, I turned the job down because I didn't want to leave the airline business, even though the future was unknown. And my father-in-law said, you know, you might get a legal pad out and put a line down the center of the page. The things that's good about the airline job on one side and the cruise line job on the other. And we went through the list and he asked me a bunch of questions. He says, how many things you got on the airline side? I said, none. How many things you got on the cruise side? He said, everything. They said, well, it wouldn't have to kick me in the ass to go ahead and take that job. I'm getting ready to call the cruise line back to say I've changed my mind. They call me and gave me a higher salary if I was willing to come with them. So that's well, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good, but being good is, is also important. So I took this job and I was up joining NCL at a very difficult time in their future, in their career. It was uh, 1973. Uh, they had just separated from the Arison Shipping Company and the, as Carnival Cruise Lines got created. They had lost all their management. They were hiring people from anywhere they could get their hands on them. And Mr. Kloster, who owned the company, got us together. And he said, look, I want you to all go out and try 10 things that are new. 
And if keep the five that work, drop the other five and then add five new ones. And he said, you'll never be held accountable for making a good, a, a good effort if it doesn't work out. So that was a, that's all I had to hear because I knew that means it was a great place for a young person to go ahead and try new things, earn their wings and see what you could do. I brought my airline experience to the table, which was great because at that time, nobody had air sea packaging. Nobody put anything. You want to buy a cruise, you call the travel agent, book the cruise. Then you had to call the airline and book an airline seat. There was no transfer packages. It was nothing. So I put together the first air sea packages in the business, not just from Chicago, but I had air sea programs from St. Louis, Kansas City, all the smaller mid-sized cities that never had that kind of treatment. The business grew very quickly. We became a leader in the air sea business. And that was a very important part of what happened with the, with the future of the cruise industry. But what was important there was I was learning how you can use the things that you that you acquire over a period of time that you just don't you don't ever lose those kinds of things. I learned it was very valuable uh, what to go ahead and try and and you find you'd be surprised at how many things you could find out, especially in there was still deregulation. You couldn't change charge cheaper fares, but I knew that you could file for a special fare as long as every airline could use a special fare. So we actually had lower fares for the cruise customers. <clears throat> so. I did that uh, for a, a couple of months and they asked me if I'd like to do some other things. They moved me to Miami and this was, I, I got there in 1973. And by the fall of 1974, I was vice president of marketing and sales at Norwegian Cruise Lines. And I was like 26 years old at that point in time and didn't know what the hell I was doing. So I talked to the people that I work for at the advertising, our advertising agency. And I said, look, I don't know anything about the advertising business, but if you make me real smart, real fast, you'll have a friend for life. So I just reached out to as many people as I could, was not shy, and including suppliers, because the supplier is not stupid. If they have a contract and they can make you look good and feel better and learn about their business, you're, they're also helping themselves. I also was just another valuable thing that I learned at that time. Cruising was not a big business yet. It wasn't mainstream. The whole packaging idea made it a lot easier for people to do uh, take a cruise, but we also created a lot of new streamlining uh, aspects of the industry. The seven-day cruise became the dominant program. We had three ships. So I said, instead of having all kinds of wild itineraries, let's have every Saturday, all the ships leave on a seven-day cruise, but going to different places so people could choose. Combining that with a package, all of a sudden, cruising sounded like an easy vacation to take. Plus, it was packaged. The air was included. And all of us enjoyed the benefit of that. But Royal Caribbean, Carnival, everybody, businesses grew like crazy because of that. <clears throat> so. That was a very important part of my career at that point in time. And, and another thing that happened is uh, because I had gotten to a position of some responsibility, I could try new things at even a, a higher level, creating new itineraries, new destinations. We had gotten to a point where we needed to have a new, a new product for one of our three ships. And everybody was going to San Juan and St. Thomas at that time. So I said, well, what about the Western Caribbean? They said, well, there's no places to go over there. I, I said, well, let's go see. And we created the first Western Caribbean itinerary in 1975 that went to Cozumel for the first time, which is now the biggest port of call in the world as a matter of visitors on a daily basis. We went to uh, Ocho Rios, Jamaica, which was where all the attractions in Jamaica were, even though the ships went to Montego Bay and also to Grand Cayman. Three very new destinations as far as Americans and Canadians were concerned. Nobody had been to these places before. Cancun was just first being built. So, but, so there was an interest in that area. This, I, this itinerary sold off the charts. The Western Caribbean itinerary that we started in 75 has been the number one selling cruise vac one week vacation for 37 years. And because it's such, because Mexico became really hot and all these other regions became familiar and it was just an, a, an open opportunity to grow. So that was a huge part. That was another thing that helped NCL of course, but it was really important for the whole industry because that opened up a whole new market. One thing that happened there that which led us to our next uh, what growth and creations of products was at in Grand Cayman, uh, there really wasn't much to do except go to beautiful beaches and snorkel. So instead of doing a structured tour, we said, well, let's just give them a beautiful day at the beach. Give them some snorkels. Let's have turtle burgers on the, on the on cookout. Actually have a barbecue beach party for them. This was unheard of at the time. What we found was that we didn't have to do much to make all these people were absolutely happy as a clam. Why? Because they weren't from Florida. They weren't from Philadelphia and Chicago and New York, and they didn't get to do that stuff like we had to do in Florida as a resident. We took it for granted. They loved it. They told us, this is, why don't you do this every day? They said, this is what we'd really like to do. So I, we didn't forget that. And shortly thereafter, in our next development, 
uh, we had become a, obviously a very innovative company. Everybody was excited about trying new things. Uh, what we did was we started a product in 1977 that it was another quantum leap in the industry. And that was when we created the first private island port of call. And we took a, a, a little ship that we rebuilt, the Sunward II, which was an old Cunard ship, made it look very modern. And we did the first cruises to the out islands in the Bahamas. This changed the market there. Once again, it brought all kinds of new people in. And we, we took that beach party from Grand Cayman and expanded it to an abandoned island where we had to bring the food ashore. We had the, we brought water sports for the first time. That was the first time anybody could buy or rent the snorkeling gear on a cruise ship. We had it also created all kinds of new ventures for people to do while they're in the ports of call, which today has means onboard spending and those things that have become so critical. The cruise lines are more concerned with onboard spending on the big ships than they are on what they charge for the cruise ticket because the differences are, are radical. So that changed that business a lot. And today, I don't have to tell you what, how, if it's not important to companies like Royal Caribbean and others with their perfect days and the islands that they started, that all started with us in 1977. And it was a huge impact on the business. It expanded the short cruise markets. It did a wonderful thing for Bahamas tourism because until then, everybody thought the Bahamas was Nassau and Freeport. They forgot the other 698 islands in the chain of the Bahamas that are absolutely spectacular. This brought all that to the table and really helped our friends there. So we became really close friends and, and did a lot of stuff together. The last thing I did before I might uh, ended my years at NCL was uh, probably the most important on the long term. And that was the industry had not started to build new ships yet. And we were really tight on it and capacity. We had to get more ships. So I started out looking around for ships and I found this wonderful piece of equipment on, in La Havre, France called the SS France. And this was the biggest ship in the world at the time. I went to Mr. Kloster and I said, if we could buy that ship, well, they'd probably give it to us and we could spend some money rebuilding it. You'd have something that nobody else had and you'd have enormous capacity. That ship had as much double occupancy capacity as all three of our other ships combined. So we would almost double our capacity revenue wise overnight. So that's how the Norway came to be. And what that did was it made the ship the destination for the first time in cruising. It wasn't important where the Norway went. When people called, they said, I just want to know, can I go on September 10th? Because the ship was the attraction. It was the first time you had multiple dining rooms, multiple entertainment centers, complete shopping malls on board, uh, the professional tendering. We had purpose-built tenders just for the ship that went with it. It, was, it. it changed the business. More importantly, it became the most popular ship in seven-day cruising for the next eight years until the new ships came in that were built by Royal and Carnival and everybody else because they realized that people wanted to go on a big ship with multiple experiences and that changed the cruise industry forever. So those are some pretty innovative years. I learned an awful lot. I used it in a lot of other things that I've done. And when I left NCL at the end of the seventies, I was ready to go ahead and try some new things. And I made it, I had a very close friend who, when I was head of marketing at NCL, he was the CFO. His name was Bjorn Hermansen. And he and I were also very close friends. And I learned an enormous amount from him because I didn't have a clue about finance or anything like that. He was a genius. So we were very compatible. I was a promoter and he was he had the boots on the ground. Great combination. And we trusted each other, which was very important. So we had agreed that if we ever found an idea to start a new company, we would start our own cruise line together. And that's how Premier Cruise Lines came to be. I got I had an idea of something that I thought would work from all of our experiences. I called him. He lived in Oslo at the time. And I said, come on over, meet me in New York. I want to tell you about this project. He said, tell me about it. I said, I'm not going to tell you until you get here, but if you don't like it, I'll buy your ticket to send you back. So he came, we met in New York at the Plaza Hotel. I told him about the project and he said, yeah, that's, that will work. And what it was, was to take a, a buy a ship, completely rebuild it and start three and four day cruises, just like we did out of Miami on the Sunward Two, but do it out of Port Canaveral, Florida and say, why would you do that? Well, here's why. We knew that half of our customers for the Sunward Two lived in Florida, and half of those, or 25% of the total, lived in central and northern Florida. So if you could put a quality product close to where they lived, they wouldn't need to come to Miami. So that, And if you could have 25% of the market to yourself, that's a pretty good place to start. Not only that, but the other part we did said, well, I, we both were young family men at the time. We had young kids. And we realized how important it was to make people uh, happy on family vacations. And cruising was totally void of any family programming at the time. If you didn't go on an Easter vacation cruise or a Christmas cruise, cruising was no, nothing to take a family. It was nothing for kids to do. They were bored to death. So we gutted two whole decks on the ship that we bought. 
and we completely changed, the, revolutionized how people took kids on ships. We created recreational centers by age group. We hired 40 English nannies to run the kids program board for, the, for us. Later on, we had to change those to Americans because the English girls were wonderful, but they were homesick all the time. So we had to bring Americans on board. And what we did was we put kids menus on the ship for the first time. We put chocolate chip cookies in the cabins for the kids every day before they went to bed. We made the kids feel it was their vacation, not being dragged along on their mom and dads. And guess what? All of a sudden, we found out we could have babysitting in a group by age group. So we didn't have to worry about having a stranger in their cabin with them at night if the parents wanted to go out. All of these things were critical in terms of being able to make the family vacation part of the cruise industry. And there's no way we could fill the ships of today and the sizes that they are if we were not catering to the family vacation segment, which is the largest vacation segment in the world. So we went up there, we got, we charged higher prices. People didn't ask how much, they just wanted to know if we got a cabin. It was successful from the first day. Disney came and took a look at this. And of course we were, that was the other reason to do this was to do, we already had packages, with, not with Disney personally, but in central Florida that were very popular. Three days on the ship, four days at, the, at a Disney resort or whatever, a rental car was included. So my packaging days came back and helped again. And it was a great vacation for, for the family, very easy to take. Disney said, we've been thinking about getting into this kind of business. We would like to see if we can do something together. I had the marketing executives from Disney come as our guest on the ship for a weekend. I said, but you got to bring your family. I want you to do the thing just like our customers. They came back. We took, we, I didn't even go on the ship myself. We let them go by themselves so they could experience the whole thing. Came back, went over to my office, said, we're going to do a deal with you guys. We want to go ahead and make you the official cruise line of Walt Disney World. Well, that didn't hurt our business at all because we did. We got the characters on board the ship. It, it, it get, legitimized everything that we said because Disney is like apple pie. Nobody gets screwed at Disney World that we know about. So consequently, our product elevated itself, not just to what it was, but what it could be. And we just it was very profitable for us. We grew to four ships in three years. It was, a, it, was a, it was a win all the way around, but most important, we brought the family into the vacation business. What we missed out on, which was probably the biggest mistake of all time, was we should have gone and partnered with Disney long-term on building new ships because they made so much money and they liked this business so much, they decided to go ahead and start their own cruise line. And that was a missed opportunity that I would like to, <laughs> I would like to be a part of today. But it was certainly successful. Premier was, was an incredible product for the industry. Uh, and and it's something that uh, it's really, really hard to top that as far as an impact is what it was. But so that just uh, that just was where pretty much the most important things that's happened to me in the cruise industry. And uh, I, I've learned I've had a lot of other opportunities. I've been presidents of other companies. I, I consult these days uh, the, uh, since the last project that the product will be sold before the pandemic. And uh, all I can say is that uh, it's been very good to me. And it, just remember all the things you learn, even in the beginning of your career, they eventually come and help you at some point in time throughout. That's a well, well, I think I wasn't exaggerating, Glenn, right? When I said that we have an icon of the cruise industry, look, look at what Bruce was, was at the origin of. And, and th these are things that we take for granted today. The private islands, you know, every cruise line now, not just in the Caribbean, but you know, also elsewhere, have private islands, you know, in Tahiti and so on and so forth. The the concept of all packet packaging, you know, including air, the 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 concept of creating vacation not just for adults but for families. The Norway, which I and to stress what Bruce was just saying, I personally consider that the Norway was the at the origin of today's cruising world. The Norway defined the cruise as we as we uh, know it today. And, and Bruce was a part of that. So it's it's very impressive, Bruce. And and, and maybe we want to go, uh, well, Glenn and I will, will question you on a few things. We're very curious now. We talked a lot about the past and your involvement and your impact on the cruise industry. And it's very obvious that uh, your creativity, your vision is also something that we would like to tap on now to understand a little bit, okay, where is the cruise industry heading to in the next five, 10 years? So maybe we should go into that a little bit and uh, and pick your brain. <laughs> of course, you know, there's no crystal ball, but I think you, you probably are the best person to ask this kind of question. So where, where do you think the cruise industry will be heading? What kind of products specifically 
do you think we should we should maybe look at things that we haven't considered you know again when you came with the Norway people probably looked at you and said you're crazy right so let's make people say the same thing today understanding that way well, the, the more they say you're crazy the more maybe you have a good idea in mind <laughs> what do you think Bruce yeah actually that's it's it's true I, I've I there are times even when we were doing those things that, that and they were successful that I had doubts as to what it, whether it would work I mean the first fall season off season that we had when we started premier we were we we're sitting there eight weeks before departure of a September cruise and we had 50 percent load factor I said what the hell are we going to do with this and we laughed and we said well you know what we'll get through it and we we just you know wrote it out and after that we didn't we just didn't look back but you're always going to have your your questions about it. Yeah, and then questions such as also I remember, and if I may just uh, interrupt a little bit, but uh, when you created Premier Cruise Line, you did something uh, also very daring in a sense, which is not just about the product, not just about going for the family market, but you took legacy ships. For example, the Oceanic. The Oceanic was was I mean it was a, a superb Italian transatlantic liner, something that people were almost like the France, right? And you took those ships, uh, the Feder Federico Costa and other ships like this, the Atlantic, and, and you painted them all red, you know? And people were a lot like, of trouble especially, for that. <laughs> especially, yeah, especially for the Oceanic. I know people were like, well, uh, you're destroying the product and things. But what you did in doing that is you created a, a product where kids started calling the boats the big red boat, and that became the marketing thing. And yep. you you touched the hearts of kids by saying, oh, I want to go on the big red boat, mommy. And that was probably a very daring, a very risky move, but such genius in so many ways. We hey, did that with our first group. Just, let me pool. jump in on two family yeah. points because you, you, you said... Two, two, two vessels that have something to do with my family. First off, the, the Oceanic. Uh, I was on the Oceanic. I remember going to my oh, parents' yeah. Bon Voyage party in New York, circa 1973, uh, when they still let you go on board for the for those types uh, of parties. For visits, and, my, yeah. and my wife, Susan, when her family came, came over from England, they came over on the France the very mm -hmm. first time. So a little personal connection here on some of Bruce's amazing history. Yeah, my only, my only regret is never having been on the France. I really, really, I, yeah, I really, too late, <laughs> too late. <laughs> yeah, but the red thing was very funny because we had an idea when before the ship was first started uh, that we should. What, what else can we do to separate ourselves? All the ships back then were white with blue stripes, exactly. and so we've got to do something different. So I had my advertising agency take a silhouette of the ship with acetate pages. And I said, I want you to give me 10 different colors on each one of the acetates, oh, wow. let them flip over. We got all the people of the, the startup team together in the room. I said, I'm not going to say anything. We're just going to flip them. And then you tell me which one. When they went through them, they had lime green and this color and that color. They got to the red and they said, that's it. They Everyone in the room said the red is the, it stops you in your tracks. It makes you look. And sure yeah. enough, I was down in the pier after the ship started in Nassau, and mm -hmm. I was just walking back to the vessel, and I overheard this couple. They were the woman was pointing up to the ship, and uh, and I heard her say, "I wonder what's on board that ship. Anybody who would paint their ship red must have something interesting on board." So I oh, learned wow. her lesson: <laughs> don't be afraid, if, unless it's offensive, and obviously there's things you can't do. But if it's yes. just something to go ahead and get people's attention, that's the hardest thing to do in business: is to mm -hmm. get people to know you exist. And we were a new company, so that's why we did that. So I just thought, I just there was a lot more to that. But not only that, it was my employees. My employees are the ones who came up with the idea. Said, "Listen, when we're going to do the cruise and Disney package, you want to create some value, build the package up so that if you buy the cruise, Disney is free, because anybody who can get that on a vacation, they're all going to at the very least find out about it." So that was <laughs> those came from just working with your people and listening. Yeah, wow. some of the best ideas I ever had was from my staff and my team who felt like they were really they were really involved and they knew that we would listen to them. And that wasn't just a, a meeting where they were going to listen to me talk. I wanted to hear what they had to say. They're on the phones talking to the guests and the travel agents. So that was yeah, great. No, great. So now we, we have uh, about 10 minutes left. So we were a little bit uh, strained on time, but let's go over what, what do you, how do you see the future of the cruise industry? What kind of products do you think we'll have uh, could could potentially make an impact in the next five, 10 years? Well, I'm a believer in taking a look at what's around and how what you can do to, to, to take it for the next level. So there's a lot of things that we can do today that are innovative, 
but they're innovative because we don't have them in this part of the world. And yet 50% of the people who go on a cruise or a ship vacation in the world live in the United States. So it is dominantly the market that you have to win. If you're going to be successful, you've got to win it here, especially if you want to have any size. So uh, I'm very familiar with the ferry business because I worked on a project for DFDS in Copenhagen several, mm -hmm. quite a few years ago and learned a lot about it. And I always wondered why there were all these ferries all over Europe that go from Oslo to Copenhagen overnight and Germany to England. And there's nothing in the United States. And we have all the rich people that live in all these coastal areas and they, they have no choice. All the, and and, and those, ferries, country, those ferries in Europe are very close to cruise ship product. It very it's often. a cruise and ship they're... on top of a garage is what it correct. is. Correct, correct. And, and you, what, so I'm, I'm sitting here to myself. So what, if you want to go to Cancun on a vacation, you have to, you either fly or you have to be a really good swimmer to get there because there's no <laughs> way to really get down there other than to take a flight. The airlines have you where they want you and they, the fares are not cheap. Airline travel isn't as much fun as it used to be. Last time I went to the airport, it wasn't a heartwarming experience. You wait in line, you go through security, you do this, you do that. It's even, unless you're traveling first class where they really take care of you, you really, you have to fend for yourself in air travel today. It's like taking the bus. So- yeah. We don't need everybody to want to do this, but can you imagine getting on a, a, a cruise ferry that's really nice? You have great food and service on board. You can take your car with you. So when you get to the Yucatan, you can drive around to all the archaeological sites. If we just get the affluent customer who's, who can take an extra day or two on the seven-day vacation to make it 10 so they can go round trip on the ferry, they get wine and dine. It, as an example, if you live in Atlanta, Georgia, you can put your bags in your car in the driveway of your home early in the morning drive down to Tampa on the same day, get on the ferry that night. And you never, and then when the ferry gets to Mexico, we've arranged for the opportunities in the future to have clear, customs clearance on board the ship while you're en route. So you don't even have to clear immigrations and customs when you arrive. Your bags will not get out of your car until you get to your hotel in Mexico from the, when the moment you put them in your trunk. You completely avoid all the hassles at the airport. That's the kind of opportunity that this would bring to the table. I can't imagine people not liking to do that. And when you look at places like Texas and Florida with, with tremendous migration south uh, to live in the United States these days, the markets are there, the money is there, and the people are there. And Cancun, as an example, is the number one destina vacation destination internationally for Americans. And it's growing like crazy. So I can't imagine that that wouldn't be successful, but it would, I mean, you had, don't, ever, don't ever underestimate the size of the task, but there's mm -hmm. a great opportunity there. Then you could expand that. You, there's, where would, you, where would you get the ferries? There's all kinds of ferries in Europe. You have to buy one or charter one for five years or whatever you want to do. They're available and you can do that. Then after you see where it works and you learn what you want, then the real business will take off after three or four years where you then put in an order for five to seven state-of-the-art new generation of super ferries that will have much more speed, be totally green, totally sustainable, and have a, and bring ocean travel to the next level, which they all everybody wants to do that anyway. But the ferry will be perfect for that. So it's it's a business that then all of a sudden you'll find I wouldn't be surprised if ferries would happen from places like New York and Philadelphia to bring people, their cars and their families to Orlando, to Port Canaveral, to go to Disney so you don't have to drive down and yet still have your car. It's it's an industry that's waiting to happen here in North America. And we have the population and the affluency to do it. So I, I think that's going to be one. And the other one is uh, it's one of my favorite pet projects, and that is the the luxury travel. Luxury travel is booming. It's one of the, it was the fastest to return after the pandemic. What we found out was oh, people who have affluency they didn't travel during the pandemic because they couldn't, not because they couldn't, not, not because they couldn't finance it. They didn't have a job problem, and they didn't lose their jobs during the pandemic. So they first thing when the when the when the vaccines were found and travel got back to normal, they were the first ones to go to resorts. They spend the money, they stay in the nicest places, et cetera, et cetera. But the cruise industry in the luxury market has been somewhat of a, 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 a unique animal because they call their ships suites. And, uh, and I'm very familiar with them because I did some work for the tour operator putting together programs. They're great products. It, uh, the, the major luxury lines are wonderful companies. This is not a, divert, a, a negative opinion of them. But there's a difference between luxury and real luxury. And what we don't have today is a good the combination of a big enough ship that has the amenities that people like to have with them without the crowds that would allow you to do that and still provide luxury. So if somebody would take, instead of it being a 40,000 ton ship, make it a 75,000 ton ship, but still only put 400 
suites on board. So you have unbelievable space per guest, enormous space for new types of restaurant concepts with indoor outdoor dining, the opportunity to have whatever you want to put on board a ship that size. And I do believe there's also a misunderstanding. People assume that a luxury ship has to be small because the luxury customer doesn't want to be with crowds. Well, that's true. They don't want to be with crowds, but that doesn't mean they have to be on a small yeah. ship. Yeah. So if you give them the size and the scope and the amenities of a big ship without the people, they're going to love it. Why wouldn't they want to go on a big, stable, ocean-going vessel instead of a smaller ship in the ocean? It would, it, it's, it, it's definitely something that people would seriously consider. Yeah. So, I, I, I love being being myself into the luxury cruise industry. I love this idea. The only question, I, I'm going to pick your brain a little bit on this, sure. Bruce. And I agree with you, having a bigger ship with only suites. Uh, Real suites. Two-room suites with private bedrooms. Two-room suites. Minimum 50 to 60 square meters. Voila, Big perfect. Suites. And and, and people, people would love that because they want to avoid crowd, but at the same time, you're offering all the amenities that a bigger ship can provide. Yet, uh, a qu question, Bruce, how would you address, because also the, the beauty of, of being on smaller ship is to go to destinations where those big ships cannot go. So how do you factor this in? Like now, smaller ships tend to go to more yacht-like destinations. They try to go off the beaten track, right? And you, you do have much more of a separation between the big lines that go to the big ports and the luxury lines that try to innovate and go to ports that are more akin to yachting in so many ways. Having such a big ship, how do you think it, that, that could work in terms of destination management? It's Once again, the size of the ship is not as important as the amount of passengers on board. We're, we're not going to have any more passengers on board the, one of these ships than you have on the existing luxuries. Is that the okay. question is that, the, so they're not going to be crowding into a port. It's not going to be a problem. They're going to go on private guided tours and all kinds of stuff like that. The ship is not big enough that it can't fit into any place that you want to go. So mm -hmm. it's 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 bigger, but it's not a mega ship by any means. Okay, it's, very it's good. It's very, very good. different. Animal. It's wow. small. It's about the same size as a ship that would have been considered a big ship in 1988. Wow. It's, okay. you know, it's not good. that big a vessel. But the yeah. other thing that's important with the technology that you can put on it, since you have more size, these ships will be built, obviously, in an extremely sustainable way because that's what's going to be required. But there's new technology available that's already been designed for ships like this that can also provide safety and security well beyond anything that's ever been done before. Mm -hmm. One of the things that people are concerned about that pops up from time to time is what happens if, the sh if you lose power on a ship? What happens if the main engines go down? And there's been some stories where the ships have just been floating mm -hmm. around for days and it's a real mess. Mm -hmm. We will be able to, and the new vessels of, the, of tomorrow, there's not too long, it already exists, by the way, it can be done now, to have a return to port system on board. That yeah, you that, that exists, yeah. propulsion yeah. Yeah. on board yeah. the ship that will be totally independent, that can yeah. get you to a safe port as long as you're within 1,500 miles of a port, yeah, yeah. which means you'll that technology, that technology exists today, yeah. and the safe yeah, return course, to port is does. basically do, uh, making, like, for example, two engine rooms that are separate in case one of them gets completely uh, destroyed by fire or whatever, you know, at least you have another one. So all systems are duplicated or triplicated yes. sometimes. So that you have a safe return to port option at all times, and 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 you're right, uh, Bruce. And this technology exists and is being implemented on many on many ships. Uh, this will be a game changer. Market. Be a game changer for luxury cruising for another reason. And yeah. this is not knocking any any particular type of product, but what we call luxury today. Now I'm not talking about a small ship like the ones that uh, that are being built by Four Seasons that are your yacht like yeah. ships. They're very small and and Ritz Carlton. That's different. When you talk about a, a larger luxury ship, like the the large luxury lines that have five, six, seven, eight, nine ships in service, they have seventy percent of the rooms that they have on the ship are basically outside deluxe cabins with a veranda. They are not two room suites. They're not two room suites. When you can build a luxury product that has very large suites, like you would expect in a fine hotel, where you exactly. have a private dining bedroom, you have a dining area in the room, so you want to have in suite dining. The wall will open up to the outside that you when you can eat and, and feel like you're eating outside in your suite. Things that have never been done on luxury ships before, and everybody's in a minimum of a two-room suite. Now mm -hmm. you're talking to the next level of luxury that a fine hotel uh, that you would look for if you were a real luxury traveler when you went to Monte Carlo. Who, who, who do luxury. you think, you're right, who do you think will be, uh, and I know it's probably just a, a wild guess at this point, but we have many hotel chains right now jumping into the cruise industry, creating those products. You mentioned Four Seasons, Ritz Carlton, and there are others as well. Sure. But who do you think will be um, investing into this kind of luxury, ultra luxury product? Uh, do you think it's traditional cruise line that will sort of 
uh, create that or uh, new players? Uh, who, who do you it's, think will be behind that? If I was an existing large luxury cruise line with six, mm -hmm. seven ships, I, I could not afford not to pay attention to this because mm -hmm. the, the risk that they're running is they're going to say, why would I want to build a ship that's going to obsolete my own ships? Well, mm -hmm. if you think like that, you'll never change. No. So you have to figure out what the transition process needs to be so that you can utilize your existing fleet in one way and take advantage of the other. But, but in, in all probability, the game changer will come from a new brand and a new product with investors that are backed by the investment banking because they'll see the opportunity and that will force the hand. But that, I mean, if you're going to spend the same amount of money and go on a luxury cruise vacation, why wouldn't you want to take this one versus this one? Yeah, I'm I mean, it's, it's, it's a radical difference in the product line and the luxury customers want to stay in the best. No, absolutely. So ferries in the North American market and, and a new type of product for larger ships very different in the products. cruise market. One maybe last question, Bruce, on the ferries. I want to go back to the ferries. Yes, us in Europe, we're very used to that because we have ferries, not just in the northern part of Europe, but also in the Med, right? We have ferries all absolutely. over the place. So we're all sort of used to, to, in a sense, taking the ferry and and you're right, the ferries that are especially in the northern Europe are close, close to a cruise product, you know, except they, of course you bring a car on board, but very, very close to, you know, they have shows, they have multiple, multiple dining options and so on and so forth. So it, it would be very interesting to to see to see this kind of product. But do you think uh, do you think the the, the affluent um, the affluent spender would be willing to forego the airline industry to actually spend a few more days and sail on that kind of vessel, knowing that there's the ferry connect co connotation, which in North America has still sort of that. Uh, I think there's a, a whole shift of, of mind to happen right before. It's an enormous marketing challenge. There's a high degree yeah. of ignorance by Americans to travel like this. But yeah. with the airlines are helping us a lot because they're making air travel such a pain in the butt that so, yeah. people are going to be willing to look at something else. And I don't have any problem in creating an ad campaign and say, would you like to be sitting in our in your dining room and having a cocktail like this? Or do you yeah. want to be standing like this with your bags at the airport? Which would That's you rather? True. That's a very, very, there's a lot of things that you can do, but the, it is true. It is, a, it is a significant part of what would have to be done is to educate Americans on how much fun this can be. It's not for everybody. If you're a young couple on a honeymoon and you want to get down there and hit the beach in Cancun, you're going to want to fly down. You want to get there right away. But if you're a well-traveled person who would like to do something like this, and there's a lot of parts of Mexico that are not just the beach. That, And by the way, the Mexican government is spending a fortune on developing more tourism in the Yucatan. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but they're building a high-speed train that goes mm -hmm. across the entire Yucatan Peninsula to connect all the main cities, which will also facilitate the, uh, the this type of operation. So it, it's, uh, it's a great, it's... great opportunity. Yeah, and it's not just Mexico, if you think about it. And I know you've been involved also into a product that would uh, that would go to Cuba. But the, the, the situation is obviously dependent on, on politics, but Cuba could also ultimately be a market. And as well as uh, Absolutely. all the islands in the Caribbean, you know, it's not just Mexico. So you're right. This is something that could, you know, grow if, if it becomes something that's accepted by the... Uh, by, by the general public. There'll be yes. a whole mishmash. Of, there'll be ferry routes oh. all over the Caribbean within 10 years. It, once it starts, oh. if people see what's going on, the European ferry operator is going to want to come over here and set up operations. Yes. Yes. They, yes. They've actually looked at it, but the problem they've had is they've had, a, they do so well over there and they can't give up market share in their main route. So they can't pull a good ferry oh. out to go ahead and start up a new venture. It's going to come with the growth of their fleets. But as soon as they see that they can make money over here like they can make, yeah. And plus, it's a lucrative cargo market. Mexico is the largest trading partner with the United States. You're containers, right. Don't forget, we're going to carry 50 containers in the belly of this thing, at right. a couple of thousand right. dollars a pop each way. So you've You're got right. two sources of revenue and the cargo revenue is all year. It's not seasonal and you don't have to feed it and you don't have to take care of it. You just put it in the container and you go. So it's it's a that one. In fact, the European ferry operator chooses a route based on the cargo traffic first, then the passengers. That's how important the cargo can be to the profitability of a business like that. Absolutely. And Bruce, yeah, very good point. It's not just for, for guests, for passengers, you know, cargo, cargo operation is also, you know, a big, a, a big market for that. Wow. Well, looking forward to having, you know, those, uh, those, uh, those ferries. I think if there are investors listening to, to the podcast, you know, maybe they're going to jump on the opportunity, but uh, Bruce, thank you very much. Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to having uh cargo in uh, uh, ferry sorry in uh, north america 
and uh, those uh, luxury product, luxury cruise ship that, you know, combine the, well, you know, the size and the amenities that you can offer on board a bigger ship with the ultra luxury that you would find on the smaller ship. So thank you very much, Bruce. And uh, Glenn, you have a few words uh, yeah, for, for our that's... guest? Absolutely. Bruce, uh, what a pleasure. What an absolute pleasure. You, you know, you started off the talk talking about Eastern Airlines and, and you basically have brought steak and lobster to the crew. <laughs> right. You, you, you use the phrase something else. And that's that's what a what a great journey. And that and that's what cruising is all about. It's it's the it's the journey. It's it's how, it's how you get there. I don't think I've written the word. Wow. So many times in my <laughs> in my notes, as, as I have today, this was what a what a what an amazing career, what an innovative career. You're what entrepreneurship is all about, uh, and I loved what you said. Don't let necessarily a restrictive environment hold you yeah. back yeah. Uh, from from that innovation. Pick ten things, get the five that you like the best. Take the other five, replace them, and then try five more. What what a great what a great message for 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 entrepreneurs business people in general just an amazing amazing career an amazing talk so many things that you know we probably people uh, well not so much maybe me but people of a certain age might come back and just take for granted you were there you're yeah. like you're like you're like the, the the hit songwriter and you're playing that song an iconic song but you're playing it for the first time that's a very special place to be in any industry so congratulations on all all your success. And for you know, showing us what may come next. Outstanding. 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 And you know, for us, well, obviously, I'm in the cruise industry, and and, and to be honest, for us, we're, we're looking at people like Bruce with such admiration, such humility. Because again, I mean Bruce and and other people, you know, also in his in his league have created what makes us happy, what you know, we are thriving in this industry today because of some decisions that Bruce and other people, you know, made. 10, 20, 30 years ago. And, sure. and, and for that, we're very, very thankful and uh, and very humbled to uh, to host uh, Bruce Nierenberg today. So stay online for a few minutes, Bruce and Glenn, but I wanted to say thank you. Thank you to the audience for listening to the second One Tourism World uh, webinar. And we have more to come in the next few days. So thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you.